Hello there friends and welcome. Today I want you to do something different, a guide with the best archetypes for every single one of the base classes in Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous Enhanced Edition. Wrath is probably the CRPG with the biggest amount of class customization possible. Each base class has around 6 archetypes, which certainly adds up more than 100 combinations. I can't possibly go in depth into every single one of these, because we have a lot of ground to cover. Just remember that I have standalone guides for pretty much all of the greatest archetypes I'll mention here that you can check on my builds playlist to the side here or in the pinned comments down below. Alright, so let's get started with Alchemist. Alchemist does have more than one great archetype, it's just that they excel at different things, but the one that usually stands out and the most famous one is definitely Vivisectionist. It is by far one of the most stacked archetypes in the whole game. First, they have full sneak attack progression, just like a rogue, that's 10 dice of sneak attack you're getting at max level. Second, the highly powerful mutagen ability, which gives them a huge plus 4 alchemical bonus to one of their physical scores. Usually it's dexterity or strength, depending on your character. And because this is alchemical, it will stack with pretty much every other bonus to ability scores, including from spells and gear. They aren't just competent at melee, because they are also spellcasters with up to level 6 spells, mostly split between some arcane and some divine spells, usually buffs. And it's not just about powerful self buffs like bark skin, blur, shield, echolocation, greater invisibility and so on. As through the infusion discovery, they can apply any buff they have, including buffs that are personal only by default, such as shield for example, which can only be cast on the character themselves, to other allies. So with infusion you can cast shield on everyone else. And speaking about infusion, it's what is called a discovery. Notice how many discoveries alchemists get. Pretty much the same amount as a fighter does when it comes to bonus feats. And yes, you can actually use medical discoveries to achieve pretty much anything you want, from unique abilities like infusion and upgrades to your mutagen, including the highly powerful Pharaoh mutagen that grants you lots of extra attacks and stacking armor class even at level 1, but also combat trick, which lets you pick pretty much any feat you want. All of this stack together is what makes Vivisection is so OP. Grenadier, on the other hand, is a more bomb-focused alchemist, Something that Vivisectionist loses, by the way, they don't get bombs, they trade that for sneak attack. The problem with bombs is that in Wrath of the Righteous, there really isn't much support for them, unfortunately. It's an issue mostly because of how high the hit point score of the demon enemies gets. The bomb damage really can't keep up with that, outside of some very specific builds. Lastly, we also have Incense Synthesizer, which is the ultimate buff-focused alchemist, as they get unique incense abilities, to provide some very rare stacking sorts of bonuses that you cannot get anywhere else. Mostly sacred incense to crowd control, evil outsider enemies like demons and undead, and also the normal incense fog that increases the attack rolls and damage of all your party members by alchemical boosts. Alright, now let's cover the Arcanist class. Arcanists are a mix between sorcerer and wizard. They have to prepare spells in their spellbook, but they cast them spontaneously, just like a sorcerer. The best archetype is certainly Brown Fur Transmuter, because it has the most unique features of them all. First, through the powerful change ability, you can highly increase the ability score bonuses of all of your transmutation buffs, starting at a plus two later becoming plus 4 to their capstone ability Transmutation Supremacy at level 20. This plus 2 can actually be multiplied in some cases, thanks to the stacking nature of certain bonuses of different types. For example, you can use Powerful Change with the Enlarge Person spell for a plus 4 size to Strength or to Dexterity with Reduce Person, and then yet another plus 4 as Enhancement from the Animal buffs, even more from the Polymorph spells, because the bonus will be polymorph instead. So that's a lot of stuff you're stacking on your characters, it's not just a plus two. Lastly, they also have the shared transmutation ability, which lets them cast any transmutation buff, including personal only buffs, even on allies, kind of similar to the alchemist infusion ability we just discussed. There are many great targets for this, such as animal aspect, hurricane bow for ranged characters, echolocation, genie kind, transformation, and even Ice and Fiery Body for immunity to critical hits to your whole party. The only thing Brown first lose is, well, two Arcanist exploits, 
which don't matter in the long run as the number of good arcanist exploits is kind of limited and you can already get the best one at the early levels anyways which is potent magic you can acquire it right at level one now let us talk about the barbarian class the best one to me certainly mad dog as it is the archetype that grants you a full scaling pet as early as level one and speaking about pets well in most cases I'm going to pick the archetype that grants you a pet, and the reason for that is simple, if you've watched some of my other guides, then you already know pets are, to put it simply, very much overpowered in Wrath of the Righteous. They can do quite everything besides casting spells. They can tank for you with super high armor class, you can use them for mounted combat, which then means the rider's armor class won't matter at all because all of the enemies ranged at the media attacks will target the pet's AC instead, so your actual character can fully focus on offense. They have multiple attacks per round, and depending on the pet for the best ones, each of one of these attacks can trip the enemy for free, which is amazing for crowd control, that's knockdown. They have super high physical scores, high hit points, they can even get teamwork fit. Pets are simply busted. It's almost, if not pretty much, as if having an extra party slot. Except for free, because remember, the pet is a side feature of your actual character, you still have your own character that you can fully develop, and then the pet. So it's not like you have to choose between one or the other. Anyways, Mad Dog is the pet archetype. It's not just about getting a pet too, because it has pretty powerful bonuses when fighting together with the pet. First, the pack tactics abilities, which highly increases the attack bonus of both your pet and your barbarian when flanking the enemy, for a plus 4 instead of plus 2, and this will even stack without flank. So that's a total of plus 6 instead of plus 2 when flanking. Flanking is super easy to do in Wrath of the Righteous. The enemy just has to be attacked by two more characters. You don't have to be on opposite sides or anything. And then the Throat Cutter ability at level 14 that lets your Barbarian get a free attack whenever your pet strip an enemy. Which is super easy to do for the pets I mentioned before like the Dog and the Wolf who automatically trip for free anyways. Now there is something to be said about Instinctual Warrior 2, which is a more defensive focused Barbarian. I honestly don't bother with it, because like I said, you can just rely on your pet's armor class for tanking anyways. Usually, Instinctual Warrior is mostly picked for multi-classing purposes, that is. People will often just pick two levels into it, because of the Cunning Illusion ability, which lets your Wisdom modifier be applied to armor class, so it can be a good way of increasing the armor class of Wisdom-focused characters like Monks and Clerics. Now let's talk about the Bard. Just like a Scald, the Bard can provide party-wide bonuses that you can't really get anywhere else. The best one to me is the Dirge Bard, because you don't lose anything important. You only lose the Jack of All Trades abilities, which grants you a plus one to skill checks, you know, it matters nothing in the long run, but you gain other fun abilities instead. Definitely more than the other archetypes. First, bonuses to saving throws against Necromancy, Fear, Curses and Death Effects, some of the most annoying effects in the game, but their most unique ability is the Dance of the Dead power, which lets you constantly summon skeleton allies, which can be good for distracting the enemies and also tanking, from your song ability, and as you can get the lingering performance feat to easily increase the uses and duration of this ability, it can be pretty fun. Look, it's not that the Dirge Bard abilities are overpowered or super great like let's say Vivisectionist or Brown Fur. It's just that the other bard archetypes, they don't get anything special. I suppose something could be said about Tranquil Whisperer, as their song can grant armor class instead, but honestly, usually bonuses to attack rolls are much better, because you don't need to have everyone tanking in your party. On the other hand, the more characters that can attack the enemy, the better. Now we have Blood Rager, which is a mix between the Sorcerer and the Barbarian. The best one is definitely Primalist, because it lets the Blood Rager acquire Barbarian Rage powers, and quite a lot of them, it's two every four levels at once. Rage powers are some of the best abilities in the game, so it is in your best interest to get them. When it comes to the Scald class, I'll explain why they're so good, but for now, let's just say they're pretty powerful. There is something to be said about the Blood Rider archetype too, because it is the one that gets a pet, but in this case, only starting from level 5. I'd say if you already have a class that can grant rage powers to your party, like let's say a Scald, then you won't need a Primalist, go with Blood Rider instead. The pet, as always, is that good. And speaking about pets, let us talk about a class fully focused into mounted combat from the go, the Cavalier. The best archetype being Gendarme. 
Pretty much almost all of the Cavaliers gain a pass from level 1, this stays the same, but the thing with Gendarme is it has loads and loads of bonus feats, which are all of these ones here. That's 9 bonus feats you're getting as a Gendarme, which grants them way more customizability than all of the other Cavalier archetypes. Especially because as far as melee characters, the more feats you have, usually the better, and this also lets them be of any race, since you won't be as reliant on the human bonus feat from the early levels. Now there is something to be said about the Beast Rider archetype as well, because by default, Cavaliers are restricted to the horse pet, which while not bad, well, it's not the best pet of them all. Beast Rider, on the other hand, can select any pet, even at level 1, including the best ones like the dog, the wolf, and the other tripping pets, the boar and the triceratops. The thing is, Beast Rider is usually picked for multi-classing purposes instead of Gendarme, where you want to keep to mostly full progression. Let's say you want to play as a paladin, who is also stuck with the horse pet from level 5. If you want to get any other pet instead, simply dip into Beast Rider, just one level is enough, so you can pick any pet and then resume progression into Paladin. Once you reach level 5, you'll be able to keep progression into the pet you picked before instead of being restricted to the horse. Now let's get into our first divine spellcaster, the Cleric. Cleric archetypes are honestly not that useful, I'd say. First we have Crusader if you want a more martial inclined Cleric, as it does get 5 bonus feats some of which can even be special fighter feats like Weapon Focus and Weapon Specialization. Their main downside is that they lose one domain, although you can always pick as many as you want through Mythic Progression, and they also have one less spell slot for each spell level, something that is easily overcome by merging with the Angel Mythic Path, because that supercharges your spellcasting progression anyways, so you'll have as many slots as you want. Besides that, for a more caster-focused cleric, you also have Ecclesite Urge, it doesn't really lose anything, I mean, it cannot wear armor, but that doesn't matter. There are many ways to overcome that, like through riding your pet or having rich weapons. On the other hand, they get the Bonded Holy Symbol for one more spellcast of any level, and the Domain Mastery ability. By default, depending on the god you pick, you have access to domains, and each domain will grant you a certain spell for all levels, and every level the Cleric has one spell slot that they can only prepare with domain spells. The Ecclesite Urge can also choose one of their domains and apply their domain slot to the other spell slots they have. For example, if you picked Air Domain, you could get Shocking Grasp, which is by default an Arcane spell, both as a domain slot and also a normal level 1 slot, and so on. Herald Color is the more summoner-focused archetype. The thing is, the feats you get for free, like Superior Summoning and Augment Summoning, well, you can just get them through normal progression anyways. But the only downside is that you lose a domain, and like I said for Crusader, you can get more through Mythic Progression. For another full Divine Caster, we have the Druid. Drovia Druid is actually one of my favorite archetypes. Almost all of the Druids also have a full scaling pad from level 1, just like Cavalier. And the special power of Drovia is that they have the Communal Aspect ability, which means they can use an ability similar to the Animal Aspect spell, except it hits your whole party, and by default, this is one of the personal spells that can only be used on the caster themselves. The best use for this is to share Gorilla Aspect with your whole party, because of the huge plus 4 bonus to trip. And remember, there are many paths that can trip for free on every attack they have, the dog, the wolf, and so on. So if you have a party with a lot of these pets, which is actually optimal, then Drovier can make a great contribution. The only thing they lose are the wild shape forms, which don't matter that much. They can still use shape-shifting spells like Shape Change to even get the ultimate dragon forms. Primal Druid is a bit interesting as well. You are restricted to the dinosaur or like the ancient animal pets, like Mastodon and Smilodon. The thing is, I mean, the Triceratops is great and so is the Smilodon, so it's not much of a restriction. Then they have the Primal Size special ability, which grants them the Enlarged Person spell. By default, Druids don't get the spell as level 1, which is sad because Enlarged Person is one of the best low-level buffs in the game. And starting from level 8 and then level 16, whenever the Primal Druid casts it on themselves, they'll actually gain increased bonuses, just like a Brown 4, so a plus 4 size to strengthen the constitution at 8, and then a plus 6 at 16. To me, it's mostly between Drovier and Primal Druid. Defender of the True World is something that was great in Kingmaker, because there you fought a lot of Fey enemies. In Wrath, it's all about demons, so it's kinda useless for it. Now let's return to the martial classes with Fighter. To me, Mutation Warrior is the best. It combines some of the Alchemist abilities, 
Most importantly, the Mutagen, which as I said before, is amazing. Any martial character will love having a plus 4 to their strength that can stack with everything else. Plus, and here's the best part, you retain all of the other great fighter powers. The bonus feats and weapon training, you only lose armor training, which, to be fair, is kinda useless, because in Wrath of the Righteous, as a fighter, you can easily ignore armor class through, for example, riding a pet, while they can't get a pet themselves, there is an item that grants a pet later on. But most importantly, to reach weapons and size enhancing spells. Enlarged Person, the one I mentioned for the Druid before, will grant your character reach, which means they have higher attack range. The end result is your character can attack behind your other allies, as you remain safe from enemy attacks, even without high armor class. There is also the Two-Handed Fighter, which can get some nice bonuses to Two-Handed Weapons, but overall I think Mutation Water is better, because when it comes to the boosts to two-handed fighter, let's say, stuff like greater power attack, for example, doesn't actually add that much. The mythic power attack fit on the other hand is way better. And by the way, Mutation Warrior can upgrade their Mutagen to plus 6, and later, a massive plus 8 bonus to one of their physical scores, usually strength. Now it's time to talk about a very fun class, Hunter. As you might expect, Hunters are all about pets and we already know how OP they are. They are a mix of Ranger and Druid. They have up to level 6 Divine Spells, some pretty powerful buffs. They have free teamwork feats, which are always nice because they can actually share these teamwork feats through their paths through the Hunter Tactics ability. To put it simply, the best archetype is Divine Hound. Nothing has as unique bonuses as Divine Hound as far as the other Hunter archetypes. The only thing you lose is the animal focus, which doesn't matter that much, you can easily replace this to an animal buff, like bow strength. Most importantly, you gain the very useful judgment feature, and Wrath of the Righteous is a game where judgments are very powerful, because through the aid of a mythic ability called Everlasting Judgment, as early as around level 5, your character will have infinite uses of judgment, which means you can have them on for every single battle. And here's another very fun part. The Divine Hound can automatically share the judgment bonuses to their pets, which is amazing. Especially because as your character levels, you'll get to stack more judgments. At the start it's just 1, then 2 at 8, and 3 at 16. With this you can grant very powerful bonuses to both your hunter and your pets, attack rolls, damage, and also armor class, all as sacred bonuses, which are very rare. So they also stack with pretty much everything else. The only downside, which actually isn't a penalty whatsoever, is that the Divine Hound can only get the Dog and Wolf pet. But here's the thing, these are actually the best pets in the game overall, so that's more of a bonus to us. Now let us cover the Inquisitor class. I'd say there are Actually, three archetypes that stand out here. First is the Judge Inquisitor. Their main advantage is being able to share judgment effects with party members through the Judgment Aura ability. Also, the Sentence Power, which increases the damage of all your party members against a single enemy, kind of similar to the Paladin Smite Evil ability in some ways. And that's mostly it. The downside is they lose free teamwork feats, which is kind of sad. And also the Bane ability, but that's not that much of an issue. Monster Tactician, on the other hand, is one of the best summoners in the game, because they get all of the summon spells for free as special abilities. It has not only scaling uses based on their Wisdom modifier, but also way higher duration. By default, the summon spells only last one round per level, which is super low. True Monster Tactician, they'll last one minute per class level instead, which is, to put it simply, 10 times the duration, I'm not joking. The downside is they lose judgment, and in a game like Wrath of the Righteous, like I said, for Divine Hound, because you can apply judgment infinitely, it is somewhat annoying. Lastly, we have Sacred Hunt's Master, which is kinda like a Ranger Inquisitor. You do get a pet from level 1, which is great, although for most Inquisitors, since they also have a domain like a cleric, they can just pick Animal Domain and get a pet anyways from level 4 onwards. Sacred Hunt's Master also has the very useful Favorite Enemy ability, and they will share it with their pet for extra damage against certain enemies of different types. You're mostly going to be focused on demons, as they are the most common and most powerful enemies. They also lose judgment, just like Monster Tactician. To be fair, there's yet another decent Inquisitor archetype, Sanctified Slayer, which is the one that gets sneak attack progression up to 6 dice. You keep your domain, so you can get a pet too, and you can even get bonus feats, just like the Slayer Talents, which I'll explain later on when I get to the Slayer class. 
even the sturdy target feature too. So honestly, I'd say it's actually one of the most stacked Inquisitor archetypes, at least as far as the ones that lose judgment. You even retain bonus teamwork's feats too. Now let's cover one of the most unique classes in the game, Kineticist. Honestly, I'll be blunt, the normal Kineticist is by far the best. The others simply lose too much, Elemental Engine for example, loses Supercharge, which is very useful. Meanwhile, Overwhelming Soul cannot accept Burn, which is a massive penalty. I'm not going in depth into what each of these Kineticist abilities mean, as I already have a complete guide about Kineticist where I explain every single one of them. And then we have Kinetic Knight, which does not have the Metakinesis feats, a big nope. So yeah, just go with the normal Kineticist, as strange as it might sound. Now let us cover the Magus, a Fighter Mage archetype. There are actually three archetypes that stand out here, but to me the best one is Arcane Rider by far. Once again, because it is the archetype that gets a pet from level 1, the horse. I've already explained why pets are so OP. Plus, the Arcane Rider can also share their Magus weapon enhancement abilities automatically to their pet, and this is huge. For example, you can add many powerful bonuses to your horse's attacks, like Holy, Elemental Damage, and I'm pretty sure even the extremely overpowered and the ultimate Magus ability Dimension Strike, which lets all of your melee attacks resolve as if touch attacks for a way easier time hitting the enemies, can also be applied to the horse. Lastly, they even have some bonus mounted combat feats. Sword Saint is another archetype that people usually enjoy. And while it has higher offensive potential, as far as the Magus themselves anyways, than Arcane Rider, I just don't think it's worth losing the pet. <laughs> because even if you do more damage with your Magus, the Arcane Rider also has the pet to contribute damage, so I think overall, <laughs> he is in a better spot. The horse can not only get more than 5 attacks per round, but even generate 3 attacks to your party, thanks to teamwork feats like Outflank. Eldritch Archer is pretty different, as it's focused on, unlike the other Magus characters, which are more about melee. So if you want to go with a ranged Magus, pick this, of course. Now it's time to cover the Monk class, which is actually a pretty powerful class in Wrath of the Righteous. You also have multiple decent archetypes, I have recently done an Unarmed Monk guide, so I might as well start with that, as I imagine most people when they think Monk, they think punching the enemies to death, without any weapons, just your pure fists. For that you can go with either the normal Monk, the traditional Monk the only advantage is that you have higher will saving throws progression, at the cost of not being able to pick your key powers that are already picked for you, but you know key powers aren't that useful so this isn't much of a downside. And there's of course Scaled Fist, which is usually the archetype mostly picked for dipping purposes, that is multiclassing. The main reason is Scaled Fists have an ability as early as level 1 that lets your Charisma modifier be applied to your armor class. So often you see characters focused on Charisma like Paladins and Oracles, multiclass into Scaled Fists just for this. Usually they aren't picked for full progression. If you want to focus on Quarter Steps, on the other hand, there's Quarter Step Master, which is pretty powerful as well, and can apply some very nice crowd control abilities for free for your first Quarter Step attack. We have Trip, Sunder for lower armor class, and even Disarm. Suhei is my preferred monk archetype, although this is more focused on actual weapons. Once again, because it is the pet archetype, you get a horse pet as early as level 1. Plus, even the fighter's special weapon training ability, which is amazing. And the possibility of using your flurry of blow abilities with weapons, even those that aren't of the monk list, like spears and so on. There's actually yet another great monk archetype. It is a pretty good class overall. Zen Archer, just like Eldritch Archer for Magus, this is the archery focused archetype, and quite powerful as well. You get a lot of nice bonus abilities to empower your ranged prowess. Well, I think we are now close to halfway there with the Oracle class, which is a spontaneous caster version of Cleric, kinda like Sorcerer is to Wizard. I'll be blunt, Oracle for me is best as normal Oracle, so no archetypes. Usually because pretty much all of the archetypes, they mess up your Revelation progression, and Revelations are one of the most powerful Oracle abilities ever. There is a lot of good stuff you can get here, such as... A full scaling animal companion from Nature Mystery, an aura that highly increases the saving throws of all the pets in your party, even the ability to add your Charisma modifier to your armor class instead of Dexterity, and Oracles are all about Charisma, some amazing feats that increase your martial sides too, such as War Sight for rolling initiative multiple times, and Weapon Mastery for a lot of free bonus feats, including Improved Critical 
and even the fighter unique greater weapon focus. Like I said, the other archetypes, they lose out on revelations, something that I don't enjoy. I want as many revelations as early as possible. They do make a difference. For another charisma-based class, we have the famous Paladin, a staple of most CRPGs. Paladins are a very useful class in Wrath of the Righteous, and if you want to know why, I have my Scylla build guide where I explain everything. Mostly because almost all of the dangerous enemies you fight in the game are evil-aligned, demons and so on, which is where their smite evil and most importantly the party-wide version of it, Mark of Justice, shines. To me, Paladin is also best as normal Paladin, I'm afraid. The problem is, the Paladin archetypes, they also lose too much. They either lose Smite Evil, which is a massive penalty, as it's their most important and powerful ability, Warrior of the Holy Light and Divine Guardian, on the other hand, lose spellcasting completely, which is also awful, because Paladins, they actually have pretty powerful buffs, some of which are unique to their class, like Blast Weapon, and the extremely useful Bestow Grace, Aura of Greater Courage too. Alright, now let's talk all about Ranger, one of the strongest classes in the game. The best archetype here is very simple, Demon Slayer. Nothing is as powerful as this. The Demon Slayer cannot pick favored enemies. On the other hand, they are automatically granted favored enemy against all of the demon enemies in the game. This does matter because Wrath of the Righteous actually nerfed favored enemies against demons. Usually in other games, demons fall into the favored enemy outsider, all of them. Wrath, on the other hand, divided demons into multiple groups, demons of magic, slaughter and strength, which is a big bummer because, because there is no way to get the highest favorite enemy bonus possible against all demon enemies unless you go with Demon Slayer. This split really hurt the other rangers. So the end result is Demon Slayer doesn't have any downside whatsoever because their penalty of not picking favorite enemy is actually a bonus in this game. It's also amazing for a level 1 dip because even at level 1, your character will already come with one stack of favorite enemy against all demons for a plus 2 to damage and attack rolls. Also, do note that your favorite enemy bonuses are automatically applied to your pet, and rangers, including demon slayers, do get a pet from level 4, which is great too. Now for something different, I discovered the rogue class. One of the most unique archetypes is the rowdy rogue, because you get the highly useful vital strike feat for free at level 1. Notice that by default, even the martial based characters like fighters and so on that have full base attack bonus progression, they cannot get Vital Strike so early, it's only at around level 6. Plus, as a Rowdy Rogue, you even get free upgrades to your Vital Strike at level 6 and then level 11, all gained at levels way earlier than any other class in the game would be able to acquire them. The last Vital Strike, for example, would only be achieved at level 16 by high base attack bonus classes. For a Rogue, you would never be able to get it if you kept your class pure. Now, Vital Strike, I'd say it's a matter of taste. It can be a very powerful ability, especially at early levels, because it limits you to just one attack per round. To me, I kind of prefer to go without it, because my characters usually stack a lot of attacks, so it is not as useful for my builds. But like I said, it can be pretty good, especially when you add Mythic Vital Strike to the mix for even higher damage. Knife Master is another very powerful rogue archetype, although, amusingly enough, you can actually pick it as a one level dip too, because its most powerful ability Sneak Stab, which increases your sneak attack dice from d6 to d8 with daggers, kukris, punching daggers, star knives or size, is gained right at level 1. So let's say you pick another class that has sneak attack progression, like Slayer. You just need a single level into Knife Master to get the increased dice for all of the sneak attack dice you have. Of course, even as a pure class, it can also be pretty great. And Wrath of the Righteous, because it follows the Pathfinder rule set. Unlike Dungeons & Dragons 3rd edition, if you're used to it, the number of enemies immune to sneak attack is extremely low, including bosses and so on. The third archetype is also usually picked for dipping purposes, so multiclassing, because of their frightening feature, which works with the Demoralize, Persuasion ability, and also the Dazzling Display feat. Instead of shaking the enemy, it can actually frighten them so they run away from your party. The usefulness of this depends on you, I personally find enemies running away from you kind of annoying. <laughs> Alright, now let's talk about Shaman. Shamans are somewhat like druids, they are full nature spellcasters with a full divine spell list up to level 9 spells, always amazing, but their most unique quality is the ability to get hexes. Hexes are extremely useful tools in this game, and they have multiple uses, 
You have ones such as Evil Eye to sharply debuff the enemies, and also hexes to highly increase your tanking potential, and even your chances of hitting the enemy and making saving throws. When it comes to shifting the dice rolls into your favor, especially for the higher difficulties like Unfair, you'll be glad you had a character that can provide hexes as support to your party. Now, the best archetype here is definitely Wildland Shaman. Once again, it is the pet archetype, and actually the unique half-orc only class. So to be a Wildland Shaman, you have to play as an orc. As a Wildland Shaman, you don't just get a pet, you also don't lose anything important. You don't get to pick your spirit, as you're actually limited to the battle one, but here's the thing, the battle spirit is by far the most useful one anyways, so it's not a downside. Shadow Shaman is also another pretty powerful archetype, as you get sneak attack progression, 6 dice of it, just like a slayer. This makes Shadow Shaman one of the most stacked classes in the game. You have full divine spellcasting with the possibility of merging with the angel mythic, great sneak attack progression, and also hexes to provide support. While you don't get a pet, through the aid of the nature, spirit, you can get one, although it's just at level 16, so comes kinda late, unlike Wildland Shaman, which gets their pet as soon as level 1. Now it's time to cover the Scald class, one of my favorite classes that I always use in pretty much any party, and definitely one of the best ones in the whole game as far as party support. Scald is also another one of those cases where I find the normal Scald to be the best. The others kinda lose too much for what they give. I suppose something could be said about Court Poet, because their song doesn't block spellcasting, and it actually increases the mental stats of your allies, which can help for heavy spellcaster-focused parties, but they're kinda niche. I know some also like the Herald of the Horn. You don't exactly lose anything that worthwhile, I mean, Lore Master is fun to have, so you aren't as much a victim of RNG when making skill checks with the lore and knowledge skills, it's just that I don't find the abilities they gain are that useful. The Skull's true main advantage is sharing rage powers, the barbarian powers, with party members. This can do quite a bit of everything, from granting extra attacks, to stacking armor class, higher attack bonus, even higher critical damage, it really is that good, because just like a bard, they have a song ability, and when you activate it, all of their rage bonuses are applied to all of your party members at once, and we get many uses of that per day. The problem with most of the other Scald archetypes is, as you can see, all of the little cross marks here, they mess up with your rage power progression. You not only take way longer to learn them, but you also end up with way less. And that is a massive loss to power, because when it comes to a Scald, rage powers are your most powerful ability. We are finally close to the last quarter now, and it is time to cover the Slayer class. Slayer is a very stacked class, it combines a lot of powerful stuffs in one neat little package. You have tons of bonus feats through the Slayer talents, just like a fighter, and you can even pick some of the rogue special talents with this, like the Spelling Attack, Crippling Strike, Opportunist. They even get some sneak attack progression, not as much as a rogue, but still 6 out of 10 dice, and also the study target ability for even higher bonuses to attack and damage against enemies. If you were to ask me, Spawn Slayer is my preferred choice, because you don't lose anything that you can't afford to miss. All you lose is Swift Study targets, which doesn't matter, because whenever you apply sneak attack to the enemy, you automatically study them anyways, so you don't have to bother casting this. On the other hand, you gain higher bonuses against enemies of bigger size, so large, huge, gargantuan, and even colossal at the end. Because most of the enemies you fight are outsiders, including demons, a lot of them, especially starting from chapter 2 and 3, are of big size, there are some pretty big demons, especially large size. So overall, I think the bonuses here are the best. Alright, so now we have the Sorcerer. There are some interesting archetypes here, but honestly the best one is Sylvan Sorcerer. Once again, it is the pet archetype. And think about it, there is nothing a full spellcaster would want more than having a tanky meat shield for free. Which is your pet, they can even pick any pet. While they are limited to the Sylvan bloodline, through mythic progression you can get an yet another bloodline, for example, arcane for higher DC, or the dragon bloodlines for higher elemental damage, so it's not like you're stuck with Sylvan. Because the other sorcerer archetypes don't get a pet, I honestly don't think they compare. But overwhelming mage can get a few higher points in DC, cross-blooded sorcerer can pick two bloodlines, but they have delayed spellcasting progression which is awful, 
And the Secret Sorcerer can get some extra bonus feats, but honestly, Sylvan Sorcerer is the way to go, trust me. You might not like pets, but the fact is, nothing will help as much as having a pet. You might say, oh, but I can get like plus two extra DC. Look, in the grand scheme, it means nothing compared to having a pet as early as level one, because the pet does everything. Tanking damage, as I said, it's that good. Now let's go for the War Priest class. Kind of a mix between Fighter and Cleric. Unlike Clerics, they only have up to level 6 Divine Spells, but they get a lot of bonus feats like Fighters. Including some Fighter-specific feats, just like the Crusader Cleric. I'd say you have around 3 choices here. The normal War Priest, if you want a classic martial-focused character that uses buffs and spells for support. Cult Leader, on the other hand, can provide you with Sneak Attack Progression, which is pretty powerful, but you trade 4 bonus feats for that. So depending on what build you want, this can result in too high of a cost. Lastly, Shield Bearer, if you want, a Shield Bashing focused War Priest. One that dual wields their main weapon with a shield for extra attacks. As your Shield Bearer, War Priest weapon enhancements will directly affect your shield instead. Plus you don't really lose out on anything that needed, and you even gain Shield Bash for free. Now we only have two classes left and it's time to cover the Witch. Which is our full arcane spellcasters like wizards and sorcerers, but they are also the class with the highest amount of hexes. The same hexes the shaman gets. I'd say there are two ways of building your witch. First, the normal witch, if you want a prepared caster, focused on intelligence just like a wizard. Or the stigmatized witch, a witch that casts spells spontaneously based on charisma just like a sorcerer. They trade their patron for an oracle curse, which is kind of a bummer because <laughs> the witch spell book by default is pretty poor, it's nowhere near as good as sorcerer and wizard, and the patron is a way of granting you much needed spells that you wouldn't get otherwise. On the other hand, if you're planning on having a witch as your main character, you can merge with the lich mythic path, which then lets you add all of the amazing lich mythic spells to your spell book, easily bypassing this limitation. The other witch archetypes, as usual, they don't really give you anything special for what you end up losing. At last, we are at the final class and archetypes, the wizard, which has always been one of my favorite classes in CRPGs. For wizard, the best archetype is also a given exploiter wizard, which combines the arcanist special exploits features with the normal wizard class. You don't really lose anything important, and what you gain is very powerful. While most of the exploits are, to put it simply, garbage, the potent magic exploit which you get as early as level 1 is a game changer, because it can increase the DC of any spell you cast by a plus 2, a huge amount for any point in the game. And this is a free action, so you can do it and then cast a spell right after during battle. Or even increase your caster level by a plus 2 too, which can help increase the duration of some buffs, or for higher spell damage in some cases. The other wizard archetypes are nowhere near as good, I'm afraid. Unfortunately, we don't have a pet granting archetype, unlike Sorcerer. Well, that was a pretty long journey, and I hope I've managed to properly explain to you why each one of these choices are the best overall. As usual, if you found this guide useful, please remember to like, subscribe, and even consider becoming a channel member. I really appreciate your support. Thank you for watching, and see you next time, friends. Perhaps with a guide on the best prestige classes, if there's enough interest.